All right. So welcome to Neuroacademy 2021. Uh, we're very excited that you're all here with us um, in this format. Um, let me first just introduce the team. So my name is Ariel. Um, I am, a, oops, sorry, here are the names also. Um, I am a researcher at the University of Washington eScience Institute. And my research focuses on neuroinformatics. I write software for analysis of, of data, mostly from neuroimaging experiments, mostly that has to do with diffusion MRI. Uh, we can talk about my, my research if you'd like later in the, in the week or next week. Uh, Noah Benson is uh, also a data scientist at the eScience Institute here at the University of Washington. He's also, uh, his research is also uh, focused on methods for analysis of um, MRI data, although he focuses mostly on functional MRI, I think is fair to say, and he can uh, also introduce himself later on in the, in the course, we'll meet him. And then uh, Jake, Jane Coe, who is a program specialist at the Science Institute, is um, here with us as well, and uh, she uh, directs many of the logistical aspects of this course, how things hang together. So this is the, the team. I mentioned the science Institute now a couple of times. I'll just mention it a little bit more just to say what it is. It's um, the Data Science Institute at the University of Washington. It's called the Science Institute. And it's been around for more than 10 years now. And um, we collaborate with researchers all over campus in many different departments. Uh, doing what we call data intensive discovery. And I'll, I'll talk about data intensive discovery in a few minutes. So I, I hope that I'll be clear what I mean by that. Um, so what is Neuroacademy? So Neuroacademy is a bit of a blend of different things that you might have experienced before. We think of it a bit as a summer school and there will definitely be some instruction coming on today and later this week. Um, it's also a form of a conference. We hope that you will interact with other people. You'll hear about other people's research and the things that interest other people that you'll get to meet new people from all over the world uh, that have interests similar to yours. And I added the unconference because the format that we take here is not one where we have scheduled in advance necessarily when each one of you will be presenting their work to others. Instead, we'd like you to take charge of things and put things on the schedule, add things, uh, contribute things, um, create things, create new forums, formats, ways for you to interact with others. Um, it's also a hackathon. So there will be a hackathon. Uh, and so next week we will spend most of the week in the format of a hackathon uh, where you will be creating new things and, and doing um, new kinds of things with data and with software. And we hope that we will provide enough of the background and the knowledge and the interaction this week for you to feel confident and go on and do that next week. And so Neuroacademy, as this is, uh, I believe the sixth time that we are doing Neuroacademy. And um, it started really inspired by this idea of brainhack.org. Brainhack is this kind of an organization that organizes uh, events around conferences, around the OHBM conference and other conferences, and also uh, throughout the year uh, that combine these different things, um, hackathons and conferences and, and educational opportunities. Um, this is tricky, I can't really see the my Slack right now. So if somebody is messaging me, then I am, um, okay, I'll, I, I hope that Noah is monitoring the, the um, what's going on in the, in the Slack. Um, and so it combines together this these forms of a hackathon, an opportunity for collaboration, uh, participant organized projects throughout the event, and then, um, uh, the form of an unconference presentations and um, other kinds of interactions, conversations organized by, by FEDs on site, and then uh, some form of educational. And so we, we took this format and we went much stronger with the educational part, uh, providing a lot more opportunities for um, participants to learn about things. So. Uh, you'll see how that plays into the, the schedule of the event that I'll, I'll show you in just a few minutes. Um, 
But where does this all come from? So this, this uh, quote here comes from the title of a, a brand new paper that uh, Remy Gao and many, many, many others put together about brain hack uh, that just came out um, uh, a couple of months ago. And the, the title of that paper is Brain Hack, a culture of open, inclusive, community-driven neuroscience. Uh, the idea is that through hacking, somehow we can create a more open, more inclusive, uh, more community-driven neuroscience, something that differs from what we had before. And so I want to go back a little bit in history and uh, point out uh, what the roots are of, of brain hack and hacking in general. This comes from a book called Hackers, written by Stephen Lee. Um, and he followed hackers in mostly around uh, Boston, mostly around MIT, really. Um, in the sort of 1960s, 1970s, and 1980s, and then wrote about it. And he came up with this idea of what he called the hacker ethos. Um, um, and it, it involves these following uh, uh, principles. First of all, there's the idea of the hands-on imperative, which I, I find I sympathize with, which is that you need to do things yourself in order to, to learn, in order to um, gain knowledge, maybe. Um, another important principle is sharing. That's, I think, uh, really, when you think about open and inclusive neuroscience, sharing uh, sharing the work that you do, sharing data that you collect, sharing the software that you write is important. Uh, that also dovetails with this idea that information should be free, that when we create something, when we uh, provide information, that information should be freely given. And that, that ethos led to open source software and the open source software movement. I'll talk about open source software in a few minutes too. Um, mistrust authority, promote decentralization. Um, again, this, this could help uh, create an open and inclusive community uh, driven neuroscience. Um, and then Lydia had in there uh, uh, this idea of meritocracy, which was pretty dominant in hacker culture. I've, I've stricken that over and put inclusivity instead. Um, and the two last principles is A, that you can create beautiful things with computers, uh, which I find to be true. And I think we've learned that you can create knowledge with computers through science and computers can change your life for the better. I think that's true in uh, ways both uh, profound and mundane. Uh, first of all, in the sense that um, there's a lot to learn about how computers operate. And so you can learn a lot from, from using computers and that can change your life for the better, but also in the sense that it can make your research go faster or go better, uh, be more automated. It can um, provide a, a pathway for improvement of your own career. And we'll talk about uh, careers in neuroimaging and data science um, later in the week as well. Uh, so there are various ways in which computers can change, can change your life for the better. Um, another sort of aspect of change that is going on in um, neuroscience more generally uh, that I think affects the way that we do uh, things that we do in uh, at, um, Neuro Academy is this notion of a brain observatory. This is something that I think a lot about because I do a lot of my research on these big data sets that have been coming out. And I think of these as brain observatories similar to the idea of a, a space observatory. What the astronomers do is they have these big instruments, they put them at the top of some mountain, somewhere where there are a few clouds like in Chile or Hawaii or somewhere. And then they point them to the sky and um, they make uh, they make recordings of the night sky and they make those recordings available to the entire research community to analyze. And I think we're starting to get to the point where neuroscience is also doing things like that, where big collections of data like the Human Connectome Project or the Child Mind Institute or the ABCD Project, or very ambitiously the UK Biobank is collecting lots and lots of really high quality data and then providing that data to the research community to, to do as we may do with, um, with that data. Um, I think that's really a powerful paradigm. Um, and it's it has a lot of potential. For example, if you think about the UK Biobank collecting 100,000 data from 100,000 different individuals, um, out of that sample of 100,000, just due to the natural prevalence of, of neurological disorders, about 1,000 people will convert excuse me, converted into Alzheimer's during the time of the study. And so we'll be able to study about a thousand individuals who go from not having to having Alzheimer's and see what changes occur in the brain when that happens. And that's, that's an opportunity that we just haven't had before. But of course, with this opportunity, there are a lot of challenges. This is a lot of data and how do we 
analyze this data, uh, we need a lot of different things. We need new methods for data-driven discovery, be this new kinds of statistical methods, new kinds of analysis methods. Uh, we need technologies. Um, my, my bet is on open source software. I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. And then we, we need somehow to think about how we do our science. We need to change the culture of science more towards um, team science, right? Because some people are collecting the data and other people are analyzing the data. And sometimes there's a lot of people involved and how do we coordinate that? How do we collaborate? How do we make sure that everybody gets credit for the work that they do and that everybody has the right incentives to do the work? Something that we need to think about. Um, in data-driven discovery, a lot of us think uh, about machine learning, about making discoveries, uh, making discoveries by automating the discovery as it's done from the from the data. And you'll hear a lot about machine learning uh, throughout this week and maybe also next week. Uh, but you'll also hear about data management, data visualization, reproducible research, and even data science ethics. All of these things, in my mind, fit under data-driven discovery. These are all things that we think about a lot in, at the eScience Institute when we, do our, when we do our data science. I mentioned open source software. Um, we're going to be unabashedly Python-centric at Neuro Academy. Um, part of this is that it's convenient to focus in on one thing, but also um, it's, it's a good idea to focus on this particular thing, in our opinion. Why Python? Well, it's, it's an open source uh, software. The, the language itself is open source. Um, so you don't require a commercial license in order to use it. But also, you can examine every bit of the, every bit of the code, uh, if you'd like, and learn about it and study it. Uh, it's become widely used in many different scientific fields, including in, in neuroscience. But it's also widely used uh, across different sectors. So it's used in research, but it also is used in industry. And so learning about Python is a good way to um, prepare, for example, for a transition into industry or a good way to collaborate with industry or a good way to use the uh, kinds of data science tools that are being created in industry uh, that we often want to use. Um, another advantage of Python, the reason that we use it in this kind of context is that it's relatively easy to learn. So it, it doesn't uh, take too many hours to get to the point where you can program productively in, in Python. And you'll have the opportunity to learn about that this week. Um, and then and finally, there's an ecosystem of tools that have developed in Python. So there's an ecosystem of general scientific tools. This diagram on the right here is from Jake Vanderplas. Um, you can think of it as a kind of a um, solar system of tools. There's a Python in the center, that's the language itself, but then people built a set of, of tools on top of that, tools for numerical computing like NumPy, tools for interactive computing like Jupyter, uh, tools for data visualization, for like Matplotlib or Bokeh, and tools for data management like Pandas. And then tools for scientific computing, just general scientific computing, like SciPy. And, and on top of that, people have uh, layered on layers for more specific uh, kinds of things, like Scikit-Image, which does image processing, or Network X, which focuses on analysis of networks, graphs, and so on. And finally, there's a layer of uh, very specialized tools that are specialized towards particular uh, kinds of scientific applications, AstroPy and astronomy, SunPy for um, specifically for analysis of data about the sun. And then we have neuroimaging in Python, NiPy. And uh, another example that I like just because I work on it is DiPy, diffusion imaging in Python, which specifically focuses on diffusion imaging and computational neuroanatomy. So there's this kind of ecosystem of tools. And one nice thing about that is that we can learn from each other. I can look over at AstroPy and see what they're doing in astronomy. And I can learn from that what I could do in, in my own. Uh, field of, of neuroscience. Um, and then, so, you know, one kind of approach that we'd like to foster within um, our academy and something that I mentioned and something that we need is this idea of team science. Um, and thinking about how cha we change the culture of science, how we create new forms of collaboration, be it across different research groups, across labs, across institutions, even across research fields. How do I collaborate with astronomers or with computer scientists or um, people from other fields where we have a lot in common, where we can gain from collaborating? How do we, how, how do, we do that? This requires rethinking the incentive structure. Um, how do we incentivize a computer scientist to come over into neuroscience and spend time with us, uh, teaching us about their tools and tricks? 
um, while maybe not making necessarily as much progress in their own research in computer science. But how do we how do we incentivize that? Uh, because there's a lot to gain from that kind of collaboration. Um, and then I think if you think about team science, this is also an opportunity for us to create a more inclusive culture and ingraining these ideas of collaboration we can uh, start opening ourselves up to thinking about who is not included when we're uh, doing our science and who do we need to include and what 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 kinds of people what um, what backgrounds um, who, who is in the room with us when we look around who is on our zoom call when we look at the uh, uh, rows of squares on our screen um, so this is an opportunity to create a more inclusive culture I have also added, uh, so you know, there's this icon here that represents, you know, our the idea of like collaborating and including and so on. Uh, but there are technical tools for that. So uh, there's behind this idea of team science. There may also be technical tools like Git and GitHub that you will be able to learn about, and um, Jupiter that are, are tools that facilitate that. So that's also. Um, uh, maybe an important part of this is creating the right tools for, for team science. Okay, so um, with this little bit of background about what this this whole thing is about, uh, let me talk specifically, more specifically about um, the program. Let me actually uh, stop sharing here for a second and let's see what questions do people have at this point? All right, um, so that was all background. There might be more questions coming soon as I share with you uh, the, the details of the program. So let me jump back into the slides and show you how this is going to work. Long, oh, there we go. Okay, so week one, so the, the way we planned the schedule is that week one is mostly focused on lectures and tutorials and week two is gonna be more of a hackathon. Let me show you the schedule for week one. Um, based a little bit on our experience from last year's Neuro Academy, uh, actually, let me let me stop sharing again um, and try to get a sense who who among you you can I guess you can there's a little arrow or a little a little icon for reactions at the bottom of your screen. Who here attended last year's Neuro Academy in 20, summer 2020? Um, I see a few hands. Oh, just a few. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, great. So um, for those of you who did not attend, I'll tell you a little bit about what happened last year. Well, last year, we planned to meet all in person here in Seattle. Um, we had already selected a, a, a set of participants for last year's Neuro Academy. And then, you know, around March or so, we realized that that, that was not going to happen. And uh, we pivoted to doing an online event and opened it up to anyone who wanted to participate. And, and we got a lot of participants. We had hundreds of people uh, participate in that. And we did a uh, one week event and we had these long days of, um, of Zoom lectures. And I think we've all learned a little bit from that experience, um, also from this experience and also from just the, the course of the last couple of years that um, that is a little tricky. A, you get very, very tired doing this for long, long days, and B, uh, people are in different time zones, and so coordinating across different time zones uh, requires a little bit of more flexibility. So, so this year, the the way that we've planned it, and now I'll go back to show, um, is the way we planned it is that we have on the schedule we have these four hours during which. Um, things are gonna happen live like this. And this happens, all the times here are uh, times in the Pacific uh, time zone in, in Seattle's time zone. I apologize, that's where we are. So we, we did that that way. Um, and so that covers a big, a big, uh, a large number of you are within, you know, daytime, roughly speaking, daytime within these uh, within these four hours, but also this gives us the opportunity to record as we're doing right now and then make available the videos of these recordings later on so that people in time zones that are not in daytime during this time can catch up with the rest of us before the next day uh, starts. And um, this year we decided to make the event a little bit smaller in terms of the number of participants and that's so that we can see each other like this and we can interact a little bit more 
um, and and get to know each other a little bit more. This is also part of the, the benefit of this kind of event is to get to know other people who are interested in similar things to what you're doing. Um, another thing that we changed in the schedule is that we've uh, added here um, a little bit more interactive sessions like um, tomorrow's meta-analysis and reproducibility session will be focused a lot more on interaction rather than, than a lecture. Um, and Wednesday's neuroimaging in Python Q&A with Satra Ghosh and Elizabeth Dupree uh, will be a little bit more interactive and, and more of a questions and answers session than really a lecture about about the tools. And the assumption there is that you will uh, use the, the recordings that we have, um, some, some of which are recordings from last year's Neuroacademy, some of which recordings that are newly made um, in order to view those and, and form your questions before the, the interactive sessions uh, occur. So the, the assumption is that you'll do a little bit of study on your own and um, that, that that will lead to uh, interactive the occurrences in the actor interactive sessions. So that's a little bit about uh, forum. So, okay, so within that uh, four hours, what kind of things will happen? So we have um, um, several guest lectures, we'll call them, or lectures that are going to teach uh, specific lectures on specific topics. Um, for example, tomorrow morning, uh, with Theoris Gerfalidis, we'll talk about diffusion imaging in, in Python. Um, we'll have several others of these. And then we have things that are more on, in the form of a tutorial. For example, uh, today we'll have introduction to programming in Python and cloud computing. Tomorrow we'll have uh, Git and GitHub and advanced programming in Python and so on, machine learning. These are going to be uh, tutorials that uh, primarily Noah and myself will, will be teaching. Um, so those happen during the four hours of our uh, interactive uh, sessions. Um, each morning, starting tomorrow, we'll have a little morning check-in. Basically, we'll, we'll meet here and we'll just see how things are going and hear from you what, what things need to be adjusted in what ways. And along the way, as you can see, there's a pretty full program for those uh, four hours a day of, of lectures that range uh, between, as I said, tutorials, lectures on a variety of topics and um, panels slash Q&A. We have, we'll finish the week with the careers in neuroimaging and data science panel. Um, for those of you who did attend last year, you'll see that many of the names on the schedule are new. We made an effort knowing the fact that there are going to be several people who attended last year who want to attend this year as well. We tried to um, reach out to people who weren't participating or weren't instructors in last year's uh, academy, create a little bit more of a um, diverse set of, of topics here that weren't covered last year. Uh, so you'll see some of these topics may be familiar and some of these topics are, are brand new. Uh, we're uh, excited to have new contributors to, to the, the schedule here. Um, let me see, let me stop sharing uh, and then see what, what questions do people have? David, you have your hand up. Is that because it stayed up from, uh, from when I asked it is this? Um, So that's the schedule for, and um, okay, I'll show you on Sparkle how you find your way to these to these different events. Um, let me go back to my to my slides now. Okay, so like I said, mixture of live events and asynchronous exploration. There's a library of videos. I'll, I'll show you where to find those videos, um, and then we'll have live Q and A with some of the speakers. For example, Andrew Laird. And, uh, Taylor Sallow tomorrow on meta analysis and producibility. And for that, uh, it'd be best if you watched Angie's video first before the session tomorrow. So today at some point. And then um, Satra Ghosh and Elizabeth Dupree. And then uh, Thursday next week, we'll have Russ Poldrack uh, come in and talk about challenges or more participate in a Q&A session on challenges and solutions for reproducibility and fMRI based on uh, a video of a talk that, that he gave last year that we'll provide and that you can watch and then uh, participate in this um, more interactive session with him. Okay, so that's week one. And then week two uh, looks like this. It's the schedule is, you'll see, much more sparse and is much more focused on hackathon. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what, what to, how to think about the hackathon for those of you who are participating in a hackathon for the first time. How do you, how do you approach this, this notion of a hackathon? What, what do we expect you to do and what, what you should expect to experience? 
Um, we'll start the, the day with uh, what we call resource, resource showcase. Again, these are, we've, we've asked several people to make short videos about a variety of different resources, data sets, tools that you can use during the hackathon as uh, just a, a way for you to learn about resources that you can use and, and draw some inspiration so that when you come to the hackathon and you're thinking about something, you know already where you might find the data that you need or the, the tools that you need in order to, to implement the things that you're thinking about. Um, and and uh, the people who created those videos, the, the videos, uh, most of them are already available. The people who created the videos, some of them will be available to, to chat with you during that um, Monday morning uh, research, resource showcase um, slot. Uh, so you can go in and, and talk to those people and ask them questions about, um, about the resources, get, get more ideas from them. And then at 11.30, uh, we'll have a hackathon pitches session. That means uh, folks here, so the, the hope is that during this week and during the weekend, you'll draw inspiration for all the things that you, you hear and you'll come up with ideas for things that you'd like to try to do during next week with others. Um, a hack is a, maybe like a half-baked idea or a short project, uh, something technical that you'd like to try out, something creative that you'd like to try out, some kind of data analysis, some kind of uh, maybe playful exploration of, of data. And so what we ask you to do is to prepare those ideas for the hackathon pitches session on Monday, 1130, present those ideas to people, maybe in a few sentences, and then ask people to join you. And then the hope is that by 1230, you all will have found, um, you know, things you'd like to at least uh, entertain and, and look into, and we can send you off into uh, different spaces for you to start hacking together. And um, you'll you'll hack from Monday until uh, Friday, and uh, again we've, we've uh, designed the schedule to be pretty sparse. The my sense is that when you hack together, you'll hack together with people who might be in different time zones from you, and so you'll need to coordinate a little bit um, of your work asynchronously. Um, and but but we'd want you to have a few a few hours of solid work every every day with together with others. So uh, we arranged it so that it would be different Zoom rooms that you can go into and, and talk to people and share your screen and show what you're doing and uh, work together. Um, then, so that, that'll go on, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, every morning during this week, we'll have what we call stand-up meeting. It will be very similar to our morning check-ins. We'll, we'll go into Zoom like this and meet all together and just hear what people are working on. Uh, what things are blocking people's progress and what, what things they, they would like to, uh, what resources they need, what, what they would like to do during the, the following day. And uh, that would be an opportunity also to hear what other, what other teams are doing except for your own and kind of listen in and hear and enjoy their progress as well. Um, on Thursday, as I said, we'll have a, a little break from hacking for a fireside chat with uh, Russell Poldrack. Um, and uh, we'll take a little break at 12.30 to do karaoke together. I've never done Zoom karaoke. I am really looking forward to that. I, uh, I hope that by then everybody will have overcome their natural shyness and will be willing to participate in that. And then on Friday, we'll uh, spend a couple of hours hearing from you what you did. And, and so, you know, in this last day, maybe you put together a little presentation and tell us what, what all you worked on and what you found out. and. Um, what, what you did and show us. And so that, that'll be the structure for week two. And um, and we'll be around to help you if you get stuck with things. We'll, we'll show up in your Zoom and uh, help you get unstuck. And uh, if you need any resources, you can ask us and we'll try to create those resources or provision those resources to you. Okay, um, a few sort of things to think about right now, how to hack happily. Um, a, few, a few kind of guidelines that I think about when going into a hackathon is, you know, work on something new. Don't do the thing that you usually do. You're, you know, you're out of, maybe you're out of your normal environment now and you've taken a couple of weeks off from your usual uh, research work or, or your usual work and 
um, this is an opportunity to do something new, maybe something that you've thought about but you've never had an opportunity um, to do. Uh, work with people you don't know or don't yet know. Get to know people. It's a great uh, way to get to know people. Um, learn from them and um, teach them and, and um, um, you know, foreign teen science. Um, I tend to recommend not to worry too much about the results that you'll have at the end of the hackathon, the deliverables, the outcomes. Uh, it's nice if things come together and you figure something out or you create, you know, a first uh, prototype of some tool that you, you, you thought about. But the, for me, at least, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to learn new things and sort of experiment a little bit creatively, uh, open your mind to, to new things and new ideas. And um, I should say one of the things that tends to happen to me and to other people as well in this kind of context is a feeling of um, imposterhood. Uh, I imagine many of you have heard before about the imposter syndrome. I'll just tell you what it is and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how that plays out in hackathons. The imposter syndrome is this kind of feeling that you're not in the right place somehow, that you, the people around you think that you know more than you actually do know and that they'll find out that you don't know all the things that they think that you know, and you'll be called out on it and you'll be found out as an imposter, um, that you are in fact an imposter, that you are not as um, accomplished as other people think that you are, that you don't know the things that you, you should know. And the reason this is important to mention in the context of something like Neuro Academy is that this is an environment where this tends to happen. That's because you're going to get into interaction with people that you don't know and they'll show up and they'll demonstrate some you know uh, technical ability and knowledge that you don't necessarily possess right now and uh, that might tend to lead you to tend to believe that others just know more than you so this this diagram here from from this very helpful page from Florida Atlantic University that contains really a lot of resources actually about imposter syndrome so I recommend um, if you're interested in learning more about that, I recommend going to that page because they have several resources about that. But I, I took this, this diagram from there because I think it, it demonstrates the imposter syndromes. Uh, you know, I have what I know, which is this little circle here. And I, I think that others know a whole lot because I, I interact with them and they start telling me about things that they know. Um, and it just seems like a whole lot of different things. Um, but the reality is that you interface with people and they their knowledge in a very small sense. And then, you know, other people know different slices of the world. And um, so that's, I think that's good perspective is that you know what you know, others know what they know, and there's some intersection between that, there's some interface between that, and it's a great opportunity. Um, so just be aware of the imposter syndrome, this possibility that you'll feel all of a sudden uh, out of your element. It's uh, it's uh, it may be uncomfortable, but I suggest uh, to sort of work through that and and figure out in what ways you intersect with other people. What what are your opportunities to learn from other people who know things that you would like to know, and uh, make the best of it. Um, if you're curious to learn about what kinds of things you could do in this kind of hackathon context, uh, there are a lot of examples. Um, in, on this web page, and I should say I, I'll make these slides uh, available. I'll, I'll post the link to those immediately after uh, I finish here to uh, the, the Slack channel um, for this for this session. And um, so you can go and see a lot of the projects. I'll just give a couple of examples from 2016. Um, Mind Control is is an app for interactive quality control of anatomical images that people worked on during uh, Neuro Academy 2016. So you can look at the code here, and eventually it also became a, a paper that was published a couple of years later. Um, it really grew out of the, the interaction that they had uh, during um, during the, that hackathon uh, in 2017. Uh, so this is this is one kind of thing you can do. You can build an app that does something, and uh, in this case, in, in, inside a web browser. Uh, fMRI avalanche analysis was a project that people worked on. Uh, this is a, a uh, analysis of fMRI data inspired by um, dynamical systems analysis. Um, uh, and they did that uh, during uh, the 2017 Neuro Academy. Uh, this one was kind of fun. Uh, the O factor was um, a group of people in 2018 who got together and uh, tried to estimate the code and data sharing by scraping through open access journals and trying to figure out you know, if there are links to uh, code and data and 
giving different journals um, an openness factor, O factor, so this is a little meta science, uh, that's fun. Um, in 2019, a group of people got together and worked on uh, these generative adversarial neural networks. Um, and so they, they trained deep learning networks to predict age from neuroimaging data, but also uh, they created these images of brains that are um, older, <laughs> Uh, kind of predicting what would happen to a young brain as it, as it ages. That was a cool project. So uh, we've created a, a Slack channel for you to start thinking, discussing um, your ideas for the, the hackathon. Uh, so you can go there and, and post your ideas, start discussing them even, even today, even um, this week. Um, okay, and speaking of which, uh, let me talk a little bit about Slack. Uh, Slack is, is this application that we um, use to communicate. Um, we've created, uh, we, we've used this to, to make general announcements. We'd like to avoid uh, sending you a lot of email. Uh, instead, this is a place where you can go and, and we will announce, we will make announcements, broadcast announcements that are important for you to know as, as the uh, course continues. Uh, we have channels for individual lectures and tutorials, including for this session, there is already uh, Slack channel, we'll create them as we go along so that people can go and, and ask questions there. Um, we This is a place where we will next week start creating channels for projects to have discussions. And then I'd just like to encourage you to feel free to create your own channel and start a discussion if there's any topic that you'd like to discuss um, in this asynchronous way. Um, um, okay, so <laughs> Another tool that we're going to use in order to coordinate our activities, and you've already gotten to, to know, is, is Sparkle. Let me go into Sparkle. Let me see, this is the wrong place. Here. So this is Sparkle. Uh, so you've uh, hopefully, um, many of you have been able, oh, let me actually stop sharing and just uh, see who is on Sparkle. Um, give me a thumbs up if you're already in Sparkle and, and able to you can use the, the reactions thing. Oh, that's what I was, that was the, what I was looking for is a, a, a screen full of thumbs up, more or less. Okay, okay good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let me share my screen again. So we're gonna, we're gonna use Sparkle. Um, currently we have these, these spaces here uh, that we're using. Um, the, then there are links to various things. I'll just show you around a little bit because uh, I think uh, it's good to see how to use this. Uh, for example, here we are Monday. So, so one way to explore this is to go to this. Um, I want to see. It didn't really appear the the thing that I wanted, but anyway, it's it's not working as I expected. But that's, oh, interesting. I don't see. Maybe I don't see some of the rows here. Uh, no, I just don't see some of the events here. Okay, I'll try to fix that later. Sorry about that. But anyway, uh, one way to explore this is to go to this uh, view that shows you the um, the schedule, um, and and then you can click on things and go to those things. Uh, we do have the schedule on the website as well. Um, this always confuse me. There we go. I close the schedule. And then so, you know, at the, the designated time, you can go to the designated place, clicking on premotor hall or bit of frontal hall or thalamus hall will take you to zoom into one of these, one of these lectures. And so these are pretty much links to zoom. Uh, the parietal library includes, as I said, a uh, library of different, um, of different videos, there's different categories. For example, if you'd like to see which videos are for the data showcase, these are the videos that are currently available for the data showcase for, for next Monday about different um, uh, resources. Um, and then um, there, there's under the neuroimaging and Python category, for example, this video uh, by Angie Laird that, that is a good, uh, good to view before tomorrow's session with, with uh, Angie. Uh, so that's the Pride Library, and there will be more. Uh, we'll add more videos in there as the as the week continues. Um, there's this Corpus Social Callosum um, space here, um, and this will will get in here for the for the next event after after this talk. 
Uh, this is organized as a series of tables and you can um, click on one of these tables to go into this space. What will happen here, I, I guess this doesn't happen right now. Oh, it, it is happening right now. Is that you see my video and if other people sit at the table then other, other people's faces will appear here and you can talk to the people who are sitting with you at that table. So it's a good, a good space to socialize and we'll, we'll use that uh, for some of the uh, social interactions um, that we'll have uh, later today. Oh, mm -hmm. And then um, one other kind of space here is this uh, Jupiter, with the wormhole to Jupiter is, um, uh, if you click on this link, it will take you to the course Jupiter Hub, which I will show you in just a minute. Um, okay, and there will be more spaces that we'll add later on. So if you keep visiting this map, there'll be other things will show up here as we need them. Okay, so speaking of the Jupiter Hub, um, we've set up an, a system for you to log into that will include um, a consistent computational environment that has the, the software that we need installed, the data that we need for the various activities installed and, um, and, and has compute on it. So if you click on hub.neuroacademy.org or you go to Sparkle and you click on this Jupyter link, it will take you to our hub. And it looks, initially it looks like this uh, unless you need a lot of memory and a lot of, uh, unless you need a lot of memory, it's a good idea to use the small, but you can get more memory if you need and maybe for your hack projects, you'll need more memory. So we have these options here as well. If you click on that, it starts um, doing this thing. And this takes, usually takes a couple of minutes. Um, sometimes it takes less, sometimes it takes more. Um, and so it's good if you're going into a session and you think you're going to be using this, uh, which you will be for many of the tutorial sessions, that's a good idea to warm that up in advance. Um, there we go. And so that will drop you into something that looks like like this. So this is, this is called this interface is called Jupiter Lab. Jupiter Lab is an interface that allows you to um, do various things. You see the file system over here on the left. I have various files in here. In here in the middle is a launcher. The launcher allows you to launch. Um, Jupyter Notebooks. Jupyter Notebooks are computational documents uh, where you can write code, for example, um, could write code in Python, for example, A equals one, print A. Uh, you can also uh, import other libraries and plot your data. And the plots get embedded within these documents. So these these Jupyter notebooks are are useful because they uh, they store the the code, but they also store the results uh, of of the computation within them. And this so you can share, you can save this document, you can share it with somebody else. Uh, a lot of our curriculum is written using those. And so each one of you should have a, a folder in your home directory called curriculum. You might not have all these folders. You'll have curriculum and you'll have data probably. Um, and inside of this is, is the curriculum that you were using. For example, there's a set of notebooks here about um, Python intro. Um, so you know, if you go here and in the intro to Python session, you'll learn more about these Jupyter notebooks and also um, uh, with time there'll be some, some code here that you can, you can execute and run. So all that is in the, in the Jupyter hub. And um, we hope that this also gives you the a good set of infrastructure for the kinds of stuff that you'll want to do next week. Um, and if there's any software that you'd like to install in here, any data that you'd like us to provide through this, uh, just let, let us know and we'll, we'll make sure to install that software or to provide that data. Inside of data, there's currently some data that we need for the instruction, um, but we can put other data in there. And what's nice about that is once we put the data in there, so you have you only have read access to this as, as participants. You only have read access to this folder, uh, but um, uh, us the instructors we have uh, write access there. And once we write something in there, it's shared across the hub to everyone that's on the hub. So it's a way to if you want a big data set that's available to everyone on your team, for example, we can put it there and you can um, have that available then to other people. Okay, and I should say we have a special command 
uh, to sync up the curriculum um, because you know, people might change things that they're presenting to you over the course of the week. So there's a command called sync curriculum and that, that syncs up the curriculum. So it's a good idea once you log in and when things get started to run sync curriculum, one nice thing about that is that it will not overwrite. If you make changes to the curriculum, it won't overwrite those changes. Okay, before I go to the code of conduct, let me stop sharing and let's just see what, what questions do people have about all of these different things that I've told you about so far. Just to repeat a question from Slack, uh, yeah. uh, someone asked if the Jupyter Hub environment was persistent. Uh, and the answer is yes. It's yeah, so so it's persistent for the duration of these two weeks, uh, we should say, and we'll let it persist for a little while longer, but at some point we'll have to turn it off. Um, so at some point during the end of next week, we'll show you how to get your stuff off of, uh, of, the, of the hub. Um, and we'll show you how to write code so that you can put it on GitHub where it will persist further than two weeks. But, but yes, uh, all this, the things that you create from today until two weeks from now, uh, it will be there every time you log in. Um, this in contrast, there are other systems like you know, Colab and, and Binder that don't have that property. Every time you log in, it's sort of a new, written a new world. Um, what other questions do people have at this point? I, I actually remembered something that I should have pointed out in the, when I was talking about the schedule. I, I want to point out one thing about the schedule that I will go back to, and that is the fact that we've designed things so that there are some things that happen in parallel. For example, this after, or today, later today, there'll be introduction to programming in Python in parallel to cloud computing. Uh, tomorrow, there'll be Git and GitHub in parallel to advanced programming in Python. And this is by design, the idea is we, we understand that people come from different backgrounds and maybe some people already already know how to program in Python and don't necessarily need this introduction to Python um, and might be interested in other things. And so the way we've designed it is that there are opportunities for people uh, during those times to learn different things. I will recommend if you are unfamiliar with programming in Python, I, I'd recommend going to this introduction to programming in Python. We'll sort of rely on that in, in other things later on. Another thing that I will recommend is if you are unfamiliar with Git and GitHub is to, to attend the Git and GitHub session tomorrow at 10.30 a.m. Uh, because again, that's those are I, I think those are two fundamental tools for, for collaboration that we will heavily use next week. So I, I do recommend doing those two. Other than that, um, I'd say, for example, on Wednesday, if you'd like to go to machine learning or Docker, it's, it's sort of up to you. Um, and there is another opportunity, a short opportunity. This is just an hour long sort of shorter version of the Docker and, and Git and GitHub tutorials that we will do on Thursday as a recap. And same here, whether you'd like to learn about machine learning in PyTorch or data visualization in Python, it's a little bit up to you and what your interests are, uh, but those are running in parallel. And of course the videos will be recorded so that you can view those things later. So if you, if you choose to do one of these two on Friday, then you can go and view the video of the other. All right, so that, that was just a short note about things in parallel. Maya, you have your hand up. Is that because you have a question? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Oh, am I muted? I'm not muted. You are not, I can hear you. Okay, great. If we wanted to, this is about Jupyter Lab. If we wanted to annotate one of the documents, like one of the tutorials could be saved yeah. in the lab, or can we, will, Will our account in Jupyter Lab save our own file of that file by default? That is a great question. Yes, if you are during the tutorial, you write notes inside of the notebook, those notes will be retained. When you run sync curriculum, this command that syncs up with, with our master version of the, of the curriculum, it does not overwrite your changes. It prefers your changes. It, it looks at it and says, oh, this, this changed over here. I'm not gonna overwrite that. Uh, so feel free to yeah, annotate as you go along and you'll have all those annotations saved there. And like I said, at, at the end, we'll, we'll show you how to get down your, your notebooks that have those annotations. Uh, Thank you. So you can save them on your machine. Yeah. What other questions do people have at this point? Um, Ariel, uh, one question I have is uh, how soon um, will the recorded uh, things appear and where, where do we find those? 
Yeah, so the, the recordings will appear in the parietal library and it's probably around a 24 hour time, something like that. Yeah, part of it is we have to upload those into YouTube and then have people on the back end create those links in, in that parietal library. So about 24 hours. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let me go on to just the next topic here. Um, so, okay, so one more topic here. So, you know, we're, we're getting to know each other and this is definitely going to be an event where we hope that you interact with each other. And when people interact with each other, we need to uh, lay, lay down a little bit of ground rules for how we interact with each other. And so uh, this event has a code of conduct. The code of conduct is uh, accessible through this link here. Um, that takes a minute because it'll take you into a Google Doc. There you go. And so the code of conduct is is rather long, and I won't read through all of it. But um, the the general guidelines are here at the top, um, and can be understood in just a few minutes of description. Which is that uh, we we're not we do not tolerate any kind of harassment, any kind of unwanted uh, contact or attention. Uh, we ask that you be respectful of others. That means not engaging in homophobic, racist, transphobic, ageist, ableist, sexist, or otherwise exclusion of behavior or language. Um, we ask that you respect the privacy and safety of others. Um, we've asked you all to allow us to take your videos. So um, uh, if you are not interested in having your face in those videos or your name, you can, you can do so on your side on Zoom. Um, we ask that you be considered of, considerate of others' participation. Um, everyone should have an opportunity to, to be heard when we're doing update sessions, um, you know, allow other people to also uh, speak. And um, yeah, and there are other things here as well. And there, there's a lot of details here. Um, and um, we are interested in your feedback. You can, you can, following the link that I just showed you, you can go in here and suggest changes to this to this code of conduct. Um, if any issues arise that require, that relate to someone's conduct, then we would like to ask you to report that either to me or to a code of conduct response team. And you see that I've left question marks here. And that's because I would like to now um, ask all of you to volunteer to participate in this code of conduct response team. Ideally, we'd have that together by today at some point. So if, if this is something you're interested in taking on, the responsibility of just being someone that people can, can contact in case there is any issue uh, with anyone's conduct, then um, feel free to message me privately. And we will, you know, tomorrow morning, maybe we'll just say, these are the people, here are their names, here's the code of conduct um, so that we can, we can have that uh, put together. What questions do people have about that? So I'd encourage you to go and look at the, at the document and see um, if, if you feel uncomfortable because of somebody's conduct, uh, you know, contact me or the uh, code of conduct response team. Yeah. Okay, finally, um, a few people to thank. For this event, uh, first of all, uh, we received funding support from the National Institute of Mental Health for this event, and we are very grateful for that. Um, we are very, very grateful for all the instructors and people involved in doing this. I'll, I'll point to them out here by going to this link here. At the bottom of the page here is a bunch of people who are going to participate in various ways, teaching tutorials, participating in the in mentoring on the hackathon, people who will be available to uh, answer questions during the hackathon, uh, people who will be participating in Q and A's and so on, and people who will be participating in, in the panel in our um, careers in neuroimaging and data science panel at, uh, at the end of the week. And all these people are volunteering their time to this. So we really appreciate that. Um, I would like to thank uh, Eric Sandell who put together the Jupiter Hub. He works for a very cool organization called 2i2c the International Interactive Computing Consortium. Um, and uh, we have him to thank for the, the very smoothly working Jupiter Hub. And then finally, Talia Kohn, who uh, <laughs> um, 
started Neuro Academy with, uh, with me a few years ago and um, is now on to uh, greener pastures and uh, has, has left his uh, academic uh, research uh, position. And uh, so now works in industry and he'll come, he'll come on on Friday to tell you about uh, what that transition from academia to industry is like, but I still like to mention that he was very instrumental in designing this, this event. Um, Okay, that was the, those were the thanks for now. There will be more thanks later on, uh, probably. Um, okay, what questions do people have at this point? All right. So now we're gonna go ahead and get to know each other. Um, what we're gonna do next is a little activity just to get to know each other. Um, let me find the link to the thing that I would like to share with you. So we're gonna play um, a wonderful game called Get to Know You Bingo, which is to say, um, we will go, uh, let me share my screen and show you where we're all going next after we get off this. So first of all, let me get my Get to Know You Bingo link here. Um, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. So, okay, I'll put that in general here. Uh, so this link here will take you to this document here, which is our bingo um, board. Uh, and the, your goal as a player in Get to Know Your Bingo is to meet other people and to um, find people. Actually, I think it's best if you download this so that you can mark the people you've found. So if you download this in document, for example, Word document, then you can start you know, checking off um, the uses of diffusion MRI data, for example, if you meet somebody who uses diffusion MRI data and so on. So go and download that onto your machine instead of marking. I don't think you can edit this anyway. Um, and then uh, in, oops, in Sparkle, let me find the Sparkle page here somewhere. I'm sure I have that. Yeah. Here we go. In Sparkle, um, you will head over to the Corpus Social Coalition. And don't do that yet, because I will explain to you next how you know where to go in once you're inside the Corpus Social Coalition. So when you go in here, um, you'll see that there are tables and they are numbered. And so, you know, you can't all sit at table number one all at once. So instead, what I'm going to ask you to do is use the Jupyter Hub in order to determine the order in which you will visit the different tables. So each one of you, I will ask you to write the following code, import NumPy. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, start, off, I'll start off by showing you uh, this card, this thing. I'll close this. So you, you'll need to enter here and then you'll need to start a launcher by clicking on this plus sign here. And in the launcher, you'll want to click on Python 3. And in Python 3, you'll want to do import NumPy as np, and then np.random.random uh, sample from range whoop, 1 through 11. Uh, those of you who know Python will understand uh, this code as doing a particular thing. Those of you who are not yet familiar with Python will learn more about what this means exactly uh, later today. But what it does do, very slowly in my case, for some reason, <laughs> it's not working as expected. Uh, let me restart the kernel. So if you go to kernel, restart kernel, that restarts this thing. And then, maybe I got the wrong code here, huh? You might try random.choice, I think. Ah, thank you. I, I think it's uh, I think it's just choice, not random choice. Oh, choice. Range one through eleven. Oops, that was strange. No, that just gives me one. Oh. Uh, <laughs> there is. Uh, <laughs> Ah, permutation is what I want, of course. Random permutation, np.random.permutation. And that gives you a random order of the numbers one through 10. 
Notice the 11 here, this needs to be 11. So for example, in my case, I would visit the tables going first to table four, then to table six, then to table seven and so on and so forth until I finished. And so you'll spend about five minutes in each one. We will uh, put up a banner in the Corpus Social Colossum every five minutes to say, hey, move on to the next one. Um, so you can um, visit each one in turn. I will, I will put the, the lines of code that you need to run. Otherwise, you know, ra randomly visit tables from one to 10. Uh, see where there's, a, where there's a seat free. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to be using the random permutation. The goal is just to meet other people and talk to them for about five minutes, hear who they are, whether they, uh, um, what was the question? Whether they cut their own hair during, during the pandemic or just did what I did, which is not cut their hair at all um, and so on. And so what I suggest we do is we take a little break first. Um, let's do a break until uh, seven minutes now just to uh, get a uh, cup of water and uh, look away from the screen for a few minutes and then come back, all go into the Corpus Social Colossum uh, for the next thing. And then we can follow the schedule from there. Hopefully we'll see you all in various uh, things like this. Um, Feel free to ask questions on Slack a lot and to um, just in general interact with us. Um, it's your Neuro Academy. So um, feel free to invent new things that you'd like to do with other people. Um, okay, see you in a few minutes. <laughs>